And we're live with JavaScript Air. Hello, everyone. My name is Kent C. Dodds, and I am your host for this JavaScript broadcast podcast all about JavaScript and the web platform. Um, today, we are going to be talking about transitioning from REST to GraphQL. And maybe not just REST, but SOAP. We might be, uh, be talking about SOAP. That would be interesting. Maybe not. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we have a couple subject matter experts with us today. Uh, so super excited to be chatting with them. Before I introduce everyone, I'd like to give a shout out to our sponsors. Uh, so first, our premier sponsor is Egghead.io. Uh, they have a huge library of bite-sized web development training videos. Check them out for content on JavaScript, Angular, React, Node, and more. Hopefully GraphQL coming soon, actually. I think somebody's working on that. Um, and then Frontend Masters is a recorded expert-led workshop with courses on advanced JavaScript, asynchronous, and functional JS, as well as lots of other great courses on front-end topics. Check them out at frontendmasters.com. Track.js reports bugs in your JavaScript before customers notice them, and with their telemetry timeline, you'll have the context you need to actually fix them. Check them out and start tracking JavaScript errors today at track.js.com. And SparkPost is email delivery built for developers. Build something awesome with their Node.js or library or SMTP relay. Start sending 100,000 emails uh, per month free with SparkPost at sparkpost.com slash JSAir. And finally, WebStorm. WebStorm is a powerful JavaScript IDE. It makes developers more productive with its super intelligent code assistance for JavaScript, Node, Angular, and React, and integration with lots of different tools. Learn more at jetbrains.com slash WebStorm. Great. So um, as a reminder, this is a live show, um, and so with that, we have the nice benefit of being able to engage you, the live viewers. And so if you have any questions, um, go ahead and ask those on Twitter with the hashtag JSAirQuestion. I'll have uh, my tweet deck up here watching that, um, and we'll answer those questions at the end of the show. And um, as a reminder, we are a weekly show, and so um, we have another show next week, same time, same place, and it is Progressive Web Apps. I'm super excited about the show because I think progressive web apps are the future and awesome and exciting. Um, and so, yeah, um, we'll, we'll have a couple guests on there. Henrik uh, Jorteg, I'm not sure how to say his last name. I should probably find out. Um, Ada Rose Edwards, Nolan Lawson, and Ben Kelly. So a bunch of different perspectives. It's going to be a great show. Um, and, yeah, that's it for my announcement. So, oh, yeah, and then always... Uh, follow us on social media, Google+, Facebook, Twitter, all that good stuff to keep up with the latest. Um, oh, and I should probably also announce there is a React Native app for JavaScript Air, which is super cool. So uh, on iOS and Android, um, check out the JavaScript Air app. So it's JS Air. Um, so yeah, great. Let's go ahead and introduce everybody. So uh, we have for our panelists, Dan Abramoff. Hi, everyone. And I will be hosting. Uh, and then for our guests, our subject matter experts, uh, we have Lee Byron. Howdy. And Stephen, oh, shoot, Stephen, I didn't ask you how to say your last name. Lucier? Give it a shot. Hey, you nailed it. Sweet. Hi, everyone. <laughs> so, awesome. Um, yeah, so Lee and Stephen, why don't you give us a quick intro to yourselves, um, who you are, where you work, what you care about, and why GraphQL like matters to you. Uh, we'll go ahead and start out with Lee. Sure. So, hi, I'm Lee. I work at Facebook and started the GraphQL project four years ago, actually, and also led the effort to redesign GraphQL and open source it last year, this time last year. Um, so GraphQL is important to me because it's my baby. Uh, but I've also seen it do some pretty awesome things at Facebook and help us build stuff that we never would have been able to build before without it. Super awesome. I know that we're talking more about transitioning from REST, um, but I would really love a backstory on, on how you created GraphQL or like where the idea came from. So we'll chat about that in a sec. Uh, Steven, why don't you go? Sure. Yeah, uh, my name is Steve Lucher. I work at Facebook. I uh, started for a year working on the Instagram web team, and now I work on the Relay team. Um, and GraphQL, to me, uh, the con the, I've landed on the relay team, and I think it's sort of it's sort of fortuitous because in the early days of React, people were really excited about building user interfaces, and they were like, "Oh yeah, declarativity! Like this makes so much sense." But then there was all this always this missing piece, 
you know, okay, well, fine, I can build this beautiful declarative UI, but how do I get data into it? How do I ferry data back and forth from my server? How do I perform mutations, you know? And, uh, you know, in, in my last company, we were, we were sort of grappling with this and sort of like circling the solution. And when Facebook, uh, when I joined Facebook, you know, Pete Hunt pulled me aside and he was like, hey, have you seen, uh, have you seen this thing, uh, this thing? Delight, that was the code name of Relay before Relay became Relay. And he showed it to me and, you know, co-located queries in the form of GraphQL that sort of looked like, you know, what, what your response format would, would be without all the values and, you know, married together with React components. And to me, it all started to make sense. Uh, so, yeah, that's why I was super excited to join Relay and, and, uh, and work together closely with, with the GraphQL team. Sweet, yeah. I love the co-location idea. Like, co-locate all the things. It makes things so much easier. So, that's great. Cool. Thanks uh, for coming on the show, um, each of you. So, to kick off our show, I think it would be great to get a baseline. I think most people who are really interested in this show probably know what GraphQL is, um, or at least have heard of it. But it would be great to get a ba uh, baseline. So, could we talk really quickly about what is GraphQL? And then maybe, Lee, you can go into the background of, of how GraphQL came to be. Sure. So GraphQL is, it's a query language, hence the QL, but it's a query language not for a database. It's a query language for your application. Um, and another way to think of it is, I've he heard it described as nested RPC. So if you're familiar with RPC, um, then nested RPC is where you can do an RPC call and then based on the output of that RPC call, do another RPC call, and then get all of the results sent back to you. Um, it started at Facebook as trying to figure out just the same problem that we've been trying to solve for a long time. Like, how do you get data that lives on the server to the client and then solve all the myriad of problems that inevitably come out of that, right? Um, the problem of, of how do you only get the data that you want so you're not just oversending data, which is especially important when you're on crappy network connections, which is basically the default now that mobile is taken over web. Um, how do you handle multiple related resources? Um, so this was a huge problem for us before when we had a more restful kind of API where we needed to load newsfeed and then we needed to load the users for the authors of every story, and then newsfeed's stories often contain other pieces of information within them, and you just, you either get all this duplication and with like a super custom endpoint, or you get these URLs, oh my gosh, my lights just turned off. Uh, you get all these URLs that you have to go load in a second run, uh, and that's super annoying either way, right? Uh, so GraphQL is an attempt to solve those kinds of problems. Um, and the origin of it was actually Nick Schrock. So uh, Nick Schrock's given some talks at Euro React Europe before. Uh, he keynoted the last React conference. So you can go learn about, about Nick. Um, and he had this idea to take our existing server code and kind of expose it in as raw a way as possible. Um, and our, our server has this framework called ENT, which is short for entities. Um, and it's, it's a really simple ORM. And what he wanted was a way to basically write like condensed PHP code that you could then send to the server, which would run, and it would be limited to only like getter functions. And it would run all those getter functions, and then it would send the data back. And so he showed me a prototype of this. Um, and you know, it was really, it was a, a super early prototype. It was kind of janky, you know, regular expressions is to parse the stuff, and like a pretty, pretty crazy executor. Um, but it totally worked, and the idea kind of blew my mind. It was like, yes, like this is, this is so much better than what we were doing before. Um, let's figure out like why, how it's going to break. Like let's figure out how to make this thing work at scale. Um, and so Nick Schrock, uh, Dan Schaefer, who was on the newsfeed team at the time, and myself um, got together to figure out how how GraphQL should look, um, and then how it should actually point at our server's data. Um, and Dan Schaefer, in particular, is pretty instrumental in that. Um, on the feed team, he, he was the mastermind of how Newsfeed would integrate with GraphQL. And that, that was like actually a pretty, pretty fast project. It went from crazy idea in the sky to like working server in about a month. Um, and then a lot of the work after that was just getting our iOS app in a much better shape 
Um, and we launched the first version of our iOS app that hit a GraphQL-based newsfeed API in the late summer of 2012, so about four years ago. Wow, that's quite a history. <laughs> uh, did you have? Some I really news? love how. Oh, it happened to me too. I really love how Lee described. Uh, you know, straight off, it's a query language not for your database, but it's a query language for your application. I like to think of like. I, you know, at Facebook, we use one monolithic GraphQL schema that describes everything you could possibly ever want to fetch. And it doesn't really matter if it's backed by, you know, a database or some, you know, microphone hanging out a window that's, like, generating entropy. Like, it could be anything, right? It sort of describes your data universe um, rather than any one particular storage backend. Um, and in this way, you can write a GraphQL schema, and I'm sure we're going to talk about this later, that uh, that fronts pretty much anything. Like you can have some fields in a GraphQL query being resolved by uh, Redis. You can have some being resolved by, uh, you know, a live video stream or, or you know, anything you can possibly imagine that you can that you can express in code. Um, but fundamentally, what falls out of that, the response format, is something that looks you know very familiar. It's, it's a record basically. It looks like JSON, behaves like JSON. Um, and it maps very, very closely to the to the query that you just made. I like to describe GraphQL, you know, Lee described it as a query language for your application. I like to sort of flippantly describe it as, uh, it's like JSON, just without all the values. <laughs> nice. So the, uh, as in, like, the query language itself, like, you look at the query and it's like JSON without values. Exactly. Cool. Cool. So, um, like... We talked a little bit about the, uh, you know, some of the problems that it, it solves. What what are some of the things that, uh, like, is, is there a point where uh, GraphQL makes sense? Um, or, or, like, does GraphQL apply to all applications? Should everybody use this? Or is it um, a little bit more complex? Um, like, or does it add too much complexity to, like, a basic um, smaller application? Um, so I don't know if complexity would be the thing that I think you you spend to use GraphQL. Actually, when we shifted from... So our iOS app used to hit a REST, RESTful API server at Facebook, and it was a lot of code. In transitioning to GraphQL, we deleted tons of code. So it actually ended up being dramatically simpler from the client's point of view. Now that's kind of where we started. Since then, you know, it's been four years, we've built lots of really complicated tools on top of GraphQL because it gives us a stable base to build those tools on. So we've, we've built up a lot of complicated things to do stuff that wasn't possible before. Uh, but none of that was required to use GraphQL. It was made possible by GraphQL. So complexity, I don't know, is, is the thing. We also... Um, in talking to server engineers, found that GraphQL helped them organize their code and shrink the amount of code that they had to write in order to surface an API. Um, I've had to write like REST framework integration code before, and it kind of sucks. It was like it's really not too dissimilar from if you're writing like an HTML-based you know website where every endpoint needs to load all the HTML for that page. Sounds simple until you realize, oh, you've got to hit these databases in this order and then fill out this template and then do this and that. And, it's, you know, it's enough work that you end up with at least a couple hundred lines of code, and those probably call out to functions, which are other lines of code. That's all kind of manual stuff that you maintain. With GraphQL, the, the mapping tends to be pretty small, and if you think about, you know, each endpoint in your REST API might be dozens, hundreds, thousands of lines of code, depending on how complicated that thing is, the corresponding GraphQL uh, type that it maps to, that you define those types, tend to be really, really small in comparison. So it's actually a simplifying force on the server as well. Um, but to get back to your question about like where are the boundaries, like where's a good idea and not a good idea, I think that depends a lot on the architecture of your application, the purposes of your API, et cetera. Um, there is a lot of greatness about REST, right? One of REST's superpowers is that everything that one resource points to is a URL, which means 
any one resource can point to anything else on the internet. You can have two APIs hosted by totally different companies that know how to talk to each other via URLs. That's not something that GraphQL tries to solve for you, right? That's in, in fact, that doing something like that in GraphQL would be very hard. Um, but it's because it's outside of the scope of the problem that we were trying to tackle. But if your application is bandwidth constrained, um, if it's uh, constrained on how many network operations it's trying to do, um, if it's constrained on the amount of code that's being written to take the output of that no network call when the REST API finally dumps you data and then parse that into model files or whatever, like if that's the focus, then GraphQL can actually be a great simplifier. On the topic of complexity, I, I think that uh, I want to go two places with this. Number one, because you can introspect a GraphQL schema, for those of who haven't used it, once you've built up a GraphQL schema that describes your data universe in a nested way with fields inside fields inside fields, like for instance, users, posts, authors, right? Sort of a cyclic relationship. Um, we have tooling that lets you uh, inspect at every level. Okay, I'm in an author. What's its type? It's a user. What fields are available on it? And any client dev from you know someone who built the schema themselves to a new intern who just joined your team can use the introspection tools to understand at a glance immediately what fields are available on user, what fields are available on post. And this literally is available through an autocomplete interface. Um, and I think these sorts of features lend themselves to uh, you know, increased developer velocity. You can move a lot faster when you uh, when you don't have to go, you know, swimming through server code to figure out. Okay, well, I'm hitting, you know, I'm hitting myapp.com/home. That's that's my that's my mega REST endpoint. What does it return? Like, what data is available on there? Um, you can introspect the query just at a glance using using tooling. And another thing about complexity that I wanted to say was that because GraphQL queries are sort of composable. They're also fragmentizable, right? You can you can break them apart into into fragments of of queries, and uh, you know what this has allowed us to do with with Relay is push a lot of the complexity of data fetching, uh, abstracting that away up into a framework level, um, so that you can do. Uh, you can do incredible things, like you can say this tiny little avatar widget needs to know this subset of this larger universe of data, like maybe the profile picture at 50 pixels and the link to um, the user's profile, right? And that's all it needs to know about. But because GraphQL queries are sort of infinitely composable, at the framework level we can you know, put an avatar into a post, into a list of posts, into a blog, application and and compose that tiny fragment of a query all the way down into a larger query that we eventually send off to the server resolve however we resolve it. Um, so these sorts of features have let us sort of abstract away a lot of complexity of, of data fetching, push them up into the framework level so that you can move really, really, really fast um, and be able to jump into a small section of an application and have an impact without having to understand the entire system. Yeah. I I think that uh, I, it's it's really cool to see um, like more and more things moving to a more composable uh, and like composability uh, design pattern where React really pushed forward the the idea of um, the composability of your different components um, and then you know bringing that into um, into our data queries having composable data queries it, it makes it a lot easier for us to like. Uh, like I totally love, like keeping co-locating as much of our stuff as possible, and so that when you, when you're a new developer coming onto a team, you say, okay, I need to update the um, avatar widget or whatever. Um, I just go to that avatar widget file and I see everything that I need to know about what makes that avatar widget work. Um, and with, you know, the CSS and JS kind of movement thing as well. Like being able to have even the CSS, the HTML or JSX, and the data stuff, everything that you need just right there in that one file or in that one folder all together, and the tests even like makes it so much easier uh, to like to come in and and make a, a quick impact. 
impact. So it's really cool to see GraphQL kind of enabling that. And it's just yeah, not, we it's have not just about... Um, sorry, go ahead, Lee. Uh, I was going to mention that, uh, you know, we've been using GraphQL at Facebook for four years, um, but this idea of collated, located fragments is actually a relatively new one. Uh, this is an idea that Relay introduced, and we're actually now taking that idea and, like, bringing it back to all of our other platforms that use GraphQL. Uh, and it's, it's been huge, because one of the serious problems that we've had in our apps, um, that is a serious problem that lots of people have in their apps, is just overfetching, just like getting more data than you end up actually using. And as we've been going through components and writing fragments that describe exactly what those components need, and then ultimately replacing, like, master query files that say, like, here's all the data you need for this whole view or this whole part of the app, we find that all of that overfetching completely goes away because we can write tools that say, you wrote in your query here that you wanted this field, but then in the same file, you never ask for it, right? It's like the same kind of lint rule that ESLint can do that's like, hey, you defined this variable and never used it. Um, and the inverse is also possible, right? Underfetching, where you end up asking for something on a model that you never actually got from the server, and then it just shows up invisible and you have a bug in your product. You can do the same trick, right? That's like using a variable without defining it first. Same lint rule. It's like, hey, you're using this thing from the model that you never defined in the query. Did you mean to, to put it in the query? And th it's been super powerful to just completely curb overfetching and underfetching in our existing apps. It's something that you know really introduced that idea. Pretty cool. Yeah, and another thing that co-location um, sort of sort of does, I, I love Greg Greg Hurl who works on um, who works on the Relay team with me. He he gave another talk, uh, a Relay deep dive um, technical talk. It's available on YouTube. I'll put the link in uh, later. And he talks about he talks about coupling. You know, isn't coupling bad? Coupling coupling it's something we want to avoid. But you know, fundamentally, the model. Of your of your data of that author is is coupled in a way that you can't you you can't avoid to the user interface right the user interface demands that certain data is present the data will will, will hydrate the user interface and what colocation lets us do is it lets us it lets us sort of embrace that coupling but make sure that that coupling occurs over a shorter distance right literally within the same component. Uh, you know, component file or, or that boundary. So an avatar can now say, okay, I'm going to admit, uh, you know, a therapy session for, for a component. <laughs> I admit that I'm coupled to my data. Um, but, you know, it's it's all right here, and I'm declaring just the parts that I need. Uh, you know, be, before you'd have to say, like, oh, okay, I need to render profile picture. And then the front-end dev would have to go all the way back into the, the back end, the REST API, and be like, you know, is the, fi if this, is the 50 pixel version being vended through slash users slash ID? If not, um, you need to put it there or put it behind a flag that's like, you know, user slash one with, with a little query param that's like include profile picture at size equals 50 comma 100, you know, something like this. Um, and that's coupling over a very, very large distance. I mean, that spans a network, that spans different technologies. Um, if we're able to co-locate the query and abstract all of that complexity up to the framework level, we're able to, to embrace this coupling over a much smaller distance, which I think is huge. Yeah, and usually when we talk about coupling, we're talking about like separating technology concerns or, or separating functionality concerns, right? Um, and one of the nice things that GraphQL lets us do is separate the concepts of actually like going to the network and doing network activity from the data that we ultimately want from the network. So when you co-locate your GraphQL with your component, you're not like, it's not code that's calling the network. It doesn't make it any less unit testable, right? It doesn't do any of the things that tight coupling costs you. Um, and so maybe coupling isn't even the right word to, to, to talk about those two things next to each other, right? Because it's not influencing how you end up actually talking to the network. Um, as, as Steven mentioned, it lets us pull all that stuff away and do it somewhere else. So it actually allows us to more loosely couple those two things to each other. Yeah, that's an, a really interesting uh, interesting idea. And I, I think that, uh, like, 
maybe what we're kind of talking about here is is dependencies, and and I guess that's why it's so like in our minds it's it's all about coupling, but uh, like in in the way that common applications are built now, you have kind of these implicit dependencies, like this avatar widget is implicitly dependent on the data that it, it receives, and yeah, maybe like it accepts all that data as props, and so like you can make it explicit in that way, but it um, it, like it doesn't really uh, do a whole lot uh, for you. I, I feel like GraphQL makes um, that just even a little bit more explicit. And then, like you know, in the same vein, um, having uh, like we're really used to having CSS, like these giant CSS files that style everything in our application, but it's like totally um, implicit, and there's no like it's. You know, then we build all these tools to find out, okay, what styles am I not using because it's implicit, like you have no way of knowing for sure. So, um, yeah, I think it's really cool that GraphQL has brought that to our data. So we, we've kind of alluded to a couple of the strengths of GraphQL, um, or, or we've talked about some of the strengths of GraphQL, and that kind of has alluded to some of the weaknesses with REST. What are some of the other things about REST that um, make developing applications a little harder that GraphQL solves? I think it's actually pretty pretty simple. I don't, I don't think there's a lot of them. I mean, REST does a lot of stuff really great, uh, but the one thing that it tends to not do great is allow you to get all the data that you need, nothing more or less, in a single round trip. Um, many REST frameworks have like extensions that let you do variations of this, where you know maybe if you ask for, maybe I have like an endpoint that gives me a list of my friends. And rather than just like simply giving me an array of URLs, which might be the like most straightforward resty thing to do, um, I can ask it to like expand. I'm like, oh, actually expand because I, I actually want to know the names of all my friends. There are a lot of REST frameworks that can do that. But I, it, what many REST frameworks don't let you do is say, OK, I don't want to just know the names of my friends. I also want to know the last group that they posted in. And then, by the way, for each of those groups, I want to know which of my friends are in those groups. And by the way, for each of those friends that are in those groups, um, I want to know their name, and I want to know who their best friend is. And I, and I want profile pictures all the way. And you, know, you, you ask for all these dependent resources. Um, it's, it's, I've never seen a REST framework that can do more than one level of inclusion of a URL resource without kind of cascading into overfetching. Um, GraphQL is designed explicitly to handle exactly that problem, where you have a mobile connection that's crappy, you have latency that's very long, and the, I just like the idea that you would have to do two network round trips where the first one has to come back before you know enough information to do the second one is just like completely insane. Yeah, and I would and say there's architecture. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, I, I was just to tag on to that. That's what leads us to kind of breaking out of REST and making these one-off endpoints. Like, oh, I'll just make this one so that I don't have to like do multiple fetches. I'll just say, okay, this is the the data endpoint for this page, and I'll get everything that I need for that page. And then no, I'll just like make that one exception. Yeah. But then you wind up making a million of those. I've gotten in that exact same trap. It's like, OK, what we really need here is you know, we're trying to build the feed for our, our, our app. So we're just going to have you know, our API slash feed. And then that's just going to give super custom stuff that's specific to that view. Um, but even that is like kind of painful, because what you've really done then is created a tight coupling between your client code and your server code. And then when your client needs to change, because you know products evolve all the time, and you're like, whoops, it doesn't need to work that way. It needs to work this other way. And you have to change the server. Uh, you have to change those in lockstep. And if we're talking about a web app that's deployed as JavaScript, maybe that's OK. You might have to worry about like a little bit of push safety, where someone has cached JavaScript and they hit your server. But that might get by. But if you have iOS or Android apps or any kind of deployed binary, once it's out there, you can't take it back. Right? So you send that out, and people are going to continual, continually hit that endpoint, expecting data to come in a certain way. And you know, the last time that I had to build apps that way, and I had to build API endpoints that just gave custom stuff, we broke stuff all the time. It was just really hard. And we ended up with these insane test plans before we could deploy, where we had to look at 
every supported version of our client, which just only grew over time, even if you're like, oh, as, as soon as somebody has more than a six-month-old version of the app, then we won't support it, which is conservative. Um, if you launch your app every month, you're still talking about like six versions of your app that you have to go test on every view to make sure that nothing broke when you change an endpoint, which basically cripples the server team. Um, and so that's why, like, when you talk to your API engineers, that's why they're so upset all the time, is because they, like, every time something breaks, it's their fault. They have to fix it. Uh, so GraphQL also, like, helped us get past that problem where the client was responsible for describing what it needed rather than the server implicitly having already written that stuff out. Um, the other thing that it ends up doing that's nice is because you have a semantic understanding of what that stuff actually is, as Stephen mentioned before, GraphQL is, has a type system in it. And every point in that GraphQL query is talking about a particular type, a user, a post, et cetera. And so when you get that data back, you know what type it is, which makes it way easier to build a caching mechanism. So you can say, like, OK, um, here's this thing that claims to be a user, and here's this other thing that claims to be a user. I can sit, store them in the same spot. Um, I can do lots of interesting things, depending on how complicated I want my caching system to be. Um, I can start to make sure when I get a query in one place that has new information that I ha make sure that's updated in all the other parts of my view, um, et cetera. It, it's much harder to do that kind of thing when the server's contract is, I will give you newsfeed, and that will be JSON. Good luck to you, right? Like, it's much harder to build a shared caching strategy around that. Yeah, and it's par it's paralyzing for developers, as you've mentioned, you know, API developers, because they they jump into this endpoint like slash feed, and they look at it, and there's so much, there's all the history of every you know thing that's ever happened to feed there, and they're terrified to remove a field because they don't know what client's using it, who's depending on it. It's very difficult to find out who's depending on it because unless you know, unless a grep of your code base turns it up. Um, you might not even know what piece of user interface is using that, whether it's being hit anymore, whether it even exists. The, even the non-presence yeah, of that recipe for in your code base. Things. Yeah, even the non-presence of that in your code base, you're like, uh, is it really? has it really been deleted? Mm, I'm just going to leave it here in this endpoint. And so you end up with these incredibly bloated endpoints that contain, you know, they read like a history text of like every experiment that you're, that your or that your company has ever tried and like failed and abandoned and you know these weird things like you know exp underscore one underscore user like you know some some <laughs> long abandoned experiment as an exercise for the reader I honestly encourage you like fire up Charles fire up an HTTP proxy and put it in front of your favorite uh, you know app that you use daily and you'll find incredible things in there it, you know reads like a storybook. Oh my gosh, one of my favorite things of all time was, um, so one of our engineers, uh, Adam Ernst, he, he is occasionally asked to visit other companies and, and gives talks about the kinds of things he's building at Facebook. Uh, and I think he, I think it was Etsy that he went to. Uh, and, the, you know, they didn't give him a prompt, they're just like, hey, it was a friend of his work there, like, can you come talk to us and tell us about some of the cooler stuff that you're building? And he decided that he was going to tell them about GraphQL. So uh, he set up uh, Charles, which is a proxying server so you can look at APIs, and he he had his Etsy app on his phone hit Charles, and then he just watched the traffic, and he basically reverse engineered their API, and then stepped through their API and then told them everything that they were doing wrong. It's like, you're doing this, that's going to be bad for these reasons. And then after he had like explained all this, then he like showed them GraphQL, and he's like, okay, let's go back through all of those and show you how we would do that with GraphQL. And he like wrote GraphQL queries. He basically came up with like the whole GraphQL interface for them, and then wrote it all out. And during the presentation, as he was like in showing, you know, the folks in the room, they're like, "Yup, we do have that problem. Yup, <laughs> what you said is correct. That did bite us." And so you know, he was just like looking at it, and from the experience of, you know, he's an iOS engineer at Facebook, so he's he's watched the app go through its many phases of life, and he was a, a pivotal member of the team that helped integrate GraphQL four years ago. So he, he's watched the kinds of problems um, that you suffer from and been firsthand at replacing them with the appropriate GraphQL queries. Uh, but I, I loved it. It was, it was one of my favorite presentations ever. I, I wish it was something that we could share more broadly, um, despite it being company-specific. But 
Stephen, as you were saying, uh, I think you can you can replicate this experiment for yourself. So whether it's your app or whether it's from your company or some other favorite app you have, hook it up to a proxy. Just like watch what happens. You'll be surprised how chatty it is, how weird those endpoints look, like the ins insaneness of the API responses that are coming back. It truly is, yeah, like a history lesson of of what that app has been through over over the time that it's been released. And to your point, you know, there are REST frameworks that try and eliminate these problems or like make it easier, but in practice, time and time again, plug in that proxy and look, and that's that's what I see in practice. People are terrified to remove things, constantly adding things, and and uh, you know, custom. The entropy is 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 this universe of custom endpoints rather than um, you know a few, uh, rather than one unified one, and that's the that's the sort of entropy that we've tried to reverse with GraphQL. You have one unified endpoint that knows how to respond to every possible query since time immemorial. It's amazing. Go if you have like an iPhone 3GS or something sitting in a drawer, you know, go go find one of those power adapters and power, you know charge it up and see if you have the Facebook app on it. It's amazing that it'll still you know the GraphQL queries that are present in that you know three-year-old version of the Facebook app, they'll still resolve today. Um, and that's something that's that's really amazing. And on the flip side, someone who's doing some you know cutting edge experiment right now in whatever product at Facebook, they're putting in all of these these fields to to do their experiment. And if the experiment fails, they can sort of just sweep away that client code with impunity. And that query is now completely flushed from the system. It's not going over anyone's wires anymore. So amazing. I, I'm seeing like I keep coming back to. Uh, to CSS, but I just see so many parallels to the problems that we have with CSS. Um, so that's just really interesting to me. Uh, so <clears throat> let's let's talk about the actual trans transition period. I think we probably talked enough about like con trying to convince people that GraphQL is a good idea um, and could really save people from a lot of problems with REST. So um, how how complicated it, is it for and I guess there's kind of two parts to a transition from REST, right? You have the, the server-side part, and then you have the, the client-side, um, whether that client's written in React or Angular or Backbone or whatever. Um, so let's talk about the server-side first. How difficult is it for somebody to take their server and turn it into a GraphQL server? It's not hard at all. Um, and here's the strategy that I usually suggest people do. And, and actually, Stephen did a super awesome talk about exactly this idea. Um, start on the client. So basically pretend that you're hitting a GraphQL endpoint, but all you're really doing is just running GraphQL locally. And what that lets you do is just play with it, right? Because often what makes changing a client-server relationship very hard is that unless you're a very tiny company, it probably involves at least two people, if not more, right? You gotta convince everyone that this is a good idea, and then you gotta plan it, and then you gotta like figure out how to deploy it, and there can be a lot of steps that need to happen until you can make your first GraphQL query and be like, ah, look, is it valuable for us now? Like you really want a much earlier point at which you can say, here's a prototype, check it out. This is what we can do with this. And you wanna be able to do that as like a one-man army. So you can actually convince people, this is what it looks like for our data at our company. So usually what I suggest is um, take a look at GraphQL.js. We made our reference implementation of GraphQL in JavaScript for the very reason that it can be run in so many environments. Run it in the browser. Um, what you do then is, because GraphQL is a query language for your application, what that actually means is every kind of field that you see in a GraphQL query maps to a, a literal JavaScript function. There's a JavaScript function that will be called, and it will return either a value or it will return a promise for a value, and that's it. That's the whole contract. So um, that's great because it turns out that talking to networks is really easy if you can talk about it as a promise to a value. You hit a REST endpoint, you get back a promise for ultimately the like JSON payload that it will return to you, um, and then you can keep going. So you can write a REST wrapper in GraphQL with a fairly small amount of code, um, Everyone should watch Steven's talk. We'll, we'll get a link up to that to that talk where he does that exact thing for three different programming languages in about 25 minutes. 
um, which is pretty awesome, for like a reasonably complicated thing. Um, so it's, it's not hard to do. Like you can do it in an afternoon to try it out for like a portion of your, of your app. Now that doesn't win you the like network chattiness problem. All that lets you do is say, okay, now I can kind of see what it would look like. I can write queries, I can get responses, I can start to visualize GraphQL for my own data. Um, but it's still being chatty over the network, right? It's still actually sending all those REST requests. The next step is to actually put that code on your server. Uh, and you could do that in a lot of different ways. Um, if you have the ability to run nodes somewhere, anywhere, um, you can just take the exact same code that you just wrote for GraphQL.js and run it on a node server, still hitting the REST endpoints. You could even put that on Heroku or something if, you're, if your REST endpoints can be hit live, which I assume they can if you're using them for your web app or iOS app or whatever. Um, and that way you can just kind of like spool it up on your own just to kind of prove the point uh, and then show how the iOS app can now look one round trip and I get all this data. Uh, and even better if you can do that in a way where you're co-locating with data centers. So if you use AWS, deploy to the same cluster. If you use Heroku, um, deploy to the same like Heroku cluster. That way the calls to your REST endpoint are happening like within the same facility and they're going to be like extremely fast. Uh, and then the final step is to actually write, like remove REST from the equation and re-implement GraphQL. And, and at that point, you can do it kind of incrementally. Um, you can go through kind of one type at a time and basically the same kind of code that you would write to implement uh, a REST framework is this, uh, roughly the same kind of code you end up writing to implement GraphQL. And you can do that kind of one type at a time, right? Uh, and then eventually you get to the point where there's no more REST anymore. Um, and you either keep that REST server alive if you have clients that depend on it, and you can have a brand new GraphQL server, uh, or, or you can remove it if you're no longer using it, and then you're just on GraphQL all the time. But that kind of progression of try it yourself, you know, be a one-man army to test it out, test it totally on the client just so you can kind of get a feel for it, then host it up somewhere, but still point it at your REST endpoints is kind of like a good one-two punch for testing it out without requiring like agreement from lots of people all at the same time. And that'll give you a basis from which to start to convince coworkers that what you're doing is actually good. I love that progression. It's, that's, you just laid it out so, so well. Um, I want to try and say exactly what you just said. Like, just like, I want to get super tactical for people because I did give a really, really tactical talk um, it's called Zero to GraphQL. You can you can search on it where I sort of live coded up one of these schemas. But this is basically how you can start, just as Lee said. There's a library. It's called GraphQL.js. There's a method, probably called GraphQL. It takes two arguments. It takes a string that represents the query and a schema that you want to execute it against. So basically, the string might look like you know, and curly braces, um, me curly braces, uh, first name, comma, email. Maybe you want to get your first name and email. So that's the string. Second argument is the schema. The schema is where you locate all of these resolver functions that know, given a user type, how to go get the first name and the, the email. And this is where you write JavaScript. In Lee's first example, where you're just purely operating on the client, those resolver functions are probably going to, like, make XHR requests to the server and hit your REST endpoints to get that user, you know, and, and pull out the first name and email fields and stuff like that. And that's like, that's the whole thing. If you, if you can, you know, pull that in, write a query that's just a JS string, write a schema using uh, our schema creation libraries um, that know, given these types, where to go get the data for them, um, then you can go get started. So you're, you're, and the return value of this function is just an object. Basically, you can think of it as the JSON response that comes from the server. So you put in GraphQL query, a schema that you've crafted that knows where to go get that data, and it will return you a JavaScript object with the response. Sweet. So on... Oh, no, we lost you. Come back. 
There you are. <laughs> Maybe. We don't, we oh, can't can hear you your, though. I can see your lips move, but not anything else. <laughs> How's it going, Dan? It's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, do we have any Twitter questions that we want to answer? Um, I think we do. I can see a, a couple Twitter questions coming in. Yeah. Uh, one of them is Juan is asking, what are the best learning resources for GraphQL? Um, that's a great question. And to be honest, there are, it's, it's actually relatively sparse right now. Um, I think there's a lot of appetite for more resources to learn about GraphQL, which is on us to some degree. Um, but the community is actually stepping up in a pretty big way there. So there's this uh, GitHub account called Awesome GraphQL, which lists out um, links to tons of different things, blog posts, uh, conference talks, libraries, um, tools that are all about GraphQL, and they try to surface the best content. Um, also, the, uh, the Meteor Apollo team, uh, so the Meteor company, they're, they're building a new client and server uh, that speak GraphQL, and they've been pretty regularly writing about GraphQL, uh, and I found those to actually be really good like introductions to GraphQL and the concepts. Um, and then once you're familiar with GraphQL and you're like, all right, I want to get into the weeds, uh, graphql.org has a lot of um, graphql.org has a lot of resources there as well. There's kind of like full articles, there's blog posts, there's just like API documentation. Um, so that's what we have now. It's still, I gotta say though, it's, it's a little sparse. We need more. We need more stuff. I have a small question. Uh, can you tell me what is the difference between Relay and this Apollo thing? So are they both like libraries on top of GraphQL? How are they different? Uh, yeah, that's a question for me. <laughs> Super embarrassing because I have not played with Apollo yet, even though we've been in close conversation with the Apollo team and sharing ideas, sharing ideas about Relay, sharing ideas about Apollo, and sharing ideas about um, about GraphQL itself. But unfortunately, I can't speak to the differences between between Relay and Apollo and their approaches. Um, yeah, because I've been in the weeds working on working on some stuff. But I very much look forward to being able to come out for air and and check out what they're doing and seeing what we can learn there, learn from them. Yeah, I I would add that you know um, there are a lot of trade offs that you make when designing clients or when designing frameworks for data on clients. You can choose to be as simple as possible. You can choose to have really complicated caching mechanisms that do smart things for you. Um, you can be very pluggable and have uh, a lot of user-provided functionality. You can be very opinionated. Right? There's all kinds of trade-offs that you can make. And even within Facebook, a lot of our frameworks make different trade-offs based on the kinds of stuff that people are building. Um, so our iOS and our Android apps, for example, are actually simpler than Relay. Like Relay does a lot of smarter things with the cache than our iOS or Android apps were doing. And we're now kind of like learning from each other. So our iOS app is taking advantage of some of the caching techniques that Relay introduced. Um, also Relay introduced that idea of co-locating fragments with the components that use the data. Um, and that was a new idea. So we, we've been stealing that one on iOS and Android. iOS and Android themselves have come up with cool ideas that Relay doesn't do. Um, one of them is the ability to look at all the possible queries that your app could ever run before you ever run the app, and then upload them all to a, your server ahead of time. So you can think of this like stored procedures for some, you know, some SQL ser uh, databases have this concept. You get back just like these really small keys that represent those queries. And then at runtime, rather than sending up a, a big string that describes the whole query you want to run, you can send up a key that represents that query which is going to be much smaller bytes. And if you're talking about, if, you know, if, if you're optimizing down to like how many TCP packets are we sending in order to do this request, you can get a query that would have been many TCP packets because it's a string down to one TCP packet for the outgoing request. And so now Relay is actually investigating what doing that would look like within Relay. So there's a lot of these trade-offs. We're learning stuff. And we're seeing new GraphQL clients pop up in the community mainly to take like a different point on that continuum of trade-offs. 
So one of my favorites that's community driven is called Loka, L-O-K-K-A, and the, the drive on that one was to be as simple as possible. So basically what it does is it helps you construct your GraphQL query, and then that's it. Like it sends the query to the network, it comes back, and you get JSON, and that's it. Um, and one step simpler than that is curl or XHR, right? It's like kind of the same that a REST endpoint would be. Like you don't have to have a client framework to hit a REST endpoint. You just XHR it, and then you get back JSON. GraphQL is very much the same way. Like if you put your GraphQL query as a parameter string and like send it, you'll get back a JSON payload, and that can be your whole client framework if you want it to be. Uh, it, it's just all kind of different points on the continuum of how sophisticated do you want your clients to be or how simple do you want your client to be. Yeah, you reminded me, I think, in conversation with the folks from the Apollo team, they were, they were definitely trying to find some different trade-offs than we've found on the current relay. And I think one of the things so, they're trying to do is they're trying to make the, the simple things really simple. And one of the key differences between Apollo and Relay in particular is the integration with other view frameworks. So Relay is unapologetically about React. It is, it is, its purpose in, in being is to tie together React and GraphQL. So the whole idea that Relay would do some other kind of view framework is just against its, its reason for existence. With Apollo, it's different. Apollo's reason for existence is not to tie React together, it's to create a common uh, library for GraphQL. And so they want to build integrations with Relay, or sorry, with React, integrations with Angular, integrations with Ember um, to be more flexible. There's trade-offs with that, right? Like if you know that you're doing React, you can do really cool specific things that have a much tighter integration with React. If you know you want to be more flexible and target other view platforms, then you have to curb that back and be a little bit more generic. That gives you that flexibility, but it also means there might be you know, additional plugins you have to use or, or some other thing that has to happen in order to make that happen. So you know, these are all just trade-offs that you can make. So I imagine that I, I can't envision a future where there's only one GraphQL client. Like that, that seems like a failed future in my mind. Like I think we will see a handful of you know, if you of the peaks and valleys of value along this continuum that people just find all the spots where where there's value, or it's like here's one that's really simple, here's one that's really flexible that can do lots of things, here's one that's great for for React, here's one that's great for iOS, right? And you're, we're just going to see a bunch. Uh, I think that'll be awesome. And this is why I'm really glad that these two projects exist because yes, really grew up unapologetically as a, you know, a way to bind queries to, to React components. But I think what we're finding, uh, you know, you can take a look at some of our recent meeting notes for Relay or the Relay Future repo. We're starting to think about how uh, the, the concepts of, like, the client store and, and all of the other, like, uh, abstractions that Relay offers, um, you know, whether we could whittle that down to a core and if React Relay could be a wrapper around that. So we're starting to explore these things, and I think the existence of the Apollo project, <laughs> the Apollo project, um, <laughs> you know, can, can only help uh, as, we, as we share ideas and, like, explore different decisions and different trade-offs. Great. Um, am I back? Yeah. Okay. Yes, you are. That was really weird. Uh, um, yeah, that was great discussion. Thanks for um, carrying the thing stuff on while I had some weird things going on. Uh, so we do uh, still have two more questions that I think are both uh, relevant and interesting. So Daniel asks, what is a good starting point for people with SQL background only? Yeah, this one's really great. Uh, there's, there's nothing that we can particularly point to, except I wanted to point to this project called PostGraphQL. Uh, it's it's actually an automatic um, schema generation library um, for for Postgres. So it'll inspect a Postgres um, uh, schema and try and generate a GraphQL schema from it. And I think if you're starting from SQL background, if you did that and started to see what the output of the schema generator was, um, then that's a that's a good way to sort of slipstream into into writing your own schema or customizing that schema further. Yeah. Great. Also, one of the things that we tried pretty hard to do with GraphQL is keep it very simple. Um, so there are extension points to let us do more complicated things, but 
it's it's actually much simpler than SQL. And in doing so, it explicitly doesn't do some things that SQL does. Um, and so if you come to it from a SQL background, probably the most important thing to know is that it's solving a very different problem than what SQL is solving. Um, SQL lets you ask arbitrary questions about a series of tabulated data. And GraphQL does not do that. Right? What GraphQL lets you do is ask, um, kind of going back to my m metaphor from before, like nested RPC. You can call a function on your server and get back the values, and then call more functions on the results of that and get back the values, and ultimately come out with kind of a JSON payload of the results of all of those operations. Um, so the query language itself is simpler than SQL, um, and it's targeted to let you do only the things that the whoever built the schema wants you to be able to do. Right? So no kind of arbitrary order buys on an unindexed field that cause super slow queries, which is actually another boon for, for server engineers and DBAs in particular, that you're not constantly hunting down like bad queries and trying to go fix them yourself. Uh, that's something that we haven't had to solve with GraphQL. That's great. Awesome. Check that out, Daniel. Uh, for Mike Williamson, our last uh, Twitter question, why the split between GraphQL regular types and input types? Why are both needed? This seems pretty specific if you could give us a little bit of background. Yeah, so um, we mentioned before that GraphQL has a type system. So GraphQL has a type system both for the kinds of things that you can ask about, and, uh, and we didn't really talk that much about this, but there's this other concept of being able to provide inputs to some of these things. Uh, so a good example is uh, there might be a field on user called um, avatar, a profile picture. And you might actually want different sizes of that thing, right? So I'd say, hey, give me the avatar for Steven Lucier. And it's like, all right, here you go, and I get this 50 by 50 pixel image. I'm like, well, that sucks, because I'm on, like, a quadruple retina display, and I want to, like, display this thing at, you know, 300 by 300 pixels. So what I really want to do is be able to provide an argument. So if you literally think about that thing as, a, like, a function, where the function is get profile picture, and the implicit first argument is like Steven, user object, and then like the next argument needs to be what resolution do you want? Um, and so for that you need input types. So input types, there's all like the scalars are the same, so you know ints, floats, strings, booleans, whatever. Um, but there are a handful of cases where you want to provide a complex input types. So you want to provide an object with fields as an input uh, or something like that. Uh, and this is relatively common when you're doing GraphQL mutations. Um, and uh, so these two type systems are different. The output types are your users, your you know, newsfeed posts, um, whatever, all the things you can ask questions about and get answers for, and your input types are all the input that you need to provide in order to uh, get the right data back out. So these two things are different because they have subtly different characteristics. Um, so one good example is those arguments. So a field has arguments and an output type, but an input type, it does not make sense to have those fields have arguments. Um, if you think about what the corollary is in a programming language like JavaScript, um, a output type is an object that contains only methods, right? It's like it's a class with like getter functions. That's an output type. And an input type is like a plain old JavaScript object that has some properties on it with some values there, right? With no functions anywhere in it, right? Um, th that's kind of a mental model that I use to distinguish the two from, from one another. Um, one of the other dis discrepancies is default values. So um, output types don't have a concept of a default value. Uh, where input types, you can say, OK, um, here's uh, like a point in the world that has longitude, latitude, and altitude. And altitude, I don't always care about. So if I don't provide it, what I mean is sea level. That's a default value. So now I can say, here's my point on the world, longitude, latitude, and that's it. And, and now we just we know you're talking about sea level. Output types aren't the same. You, you, know, you either ask for the field or you don't. There's no, there's no default value. So because there's all these discrepancies, um, we actually tried to figure out if we could make them the same. Like, are there cases where an input type and an output type are just going to be the same? And every time we tried to do it, there was just too many weird quirks and like bad edge cases, and we just decided it was it was best to keep them separate. Cool, great, thanks for that answer. Um, so there was one more question, but we don't have time for it. So if you want to check out that uh, Twitter hashtag after, I'm sure uh, Pavel would be 
very grateful. Um, so let's go ahead and get into our uh, just wrapping up um, with our tips and picks. Um, and we'll have Dan go first, then me, and then uh, Lee, and then Steven. So go ahead, Dan. Sure. So um, let me open the let me open the doc. <laughs> so for today's tip uh, is something that as I'm working I'm working on a new ACAD series about Redux, like more real world patterns. It doesn't get as sophisticated as like relate. <laughs> it's just talking to REST endpoint. But still, as I was working on a tutorial, I no noticed the pattern I uh, started following, uh, which is related to what we've been talking about, the collocation. So in Redux, what you often do is when you often want to change the, especially in the beginning as you iterate on the application fast, you want to change the state shape of your application. Like you want to introduce something new into the state shape. You want to store it in a different way for uh, as an optimization or something. So uh, this gets painful where if you uh, have to hunt for all the components and all the other parts of code that uh, rely on the specific state shape. So what I suggest doing is uh, together with the reducer, right in the reducer files, you can put the selector functions that grab, uh, that uh, they act as a public API for the state managed by this reducer. And just like you compose the reducers into separate files and then combine them, you can also compose, compose selectors and have selectors call other selectors thereby uh, ensuring that if you change the state structure, this change is lo localized in a single file and you don't have to change any other components. So this is my tip for today. Uh, I linked to a comment, uh, sorry, a place in the Redux examples where we use this pattern. And I have a bunch of picks for today. So my first pick is uh, a new uh, interface to OCaml language, which uh, Facebook released just uh, like yesterday. Uh, it is uh, a creation by Jordan Walk, uh, who's the author, the original author of React, and it's like super cool. I'm very excited about functional languages, and this is uh, a way to write uh, in a functional language with a Matu uh, toolchain, but in a syntax that kind of resembles JavaScript a lot, especially ES6. So it's a great way to introduce yourself to functional patterns and uh, functional programming in a comfortable way. Uh, another my pick is called React Tiny Renderer. It's a project uh, by um, so it's a project that uh, implements the minimal interface uh, for a React renderer. You probably never need to do it in your projects, but it's a great learning exercise into like how React works internally and how the difference between React DOM and React Native is actually uh, implemented in the code. And so this is a tiny renderer that just renders. Uh, everything uh, into JSON. So uh, my next pick is a new course by Wes Boss called R Learn Redux, which is free, is sponsored by Sentry. Big thanks to Sentry for doing it. Uh, so check it out. It's uh, People say it's really great, so it must be great. Uh, and I have another pick with uh, Mark Erickson's Link Collections. Uh, so Mark Erickson is the person who came up with Redux Fact, frequently asked questions, and he has a really good collection of links uh, in his GitHub profile, so uh, check this out. And I wanted to highlight Apollo Client again because people have been talking to me about it and asking, have I looked at it? It integrates Redux with GraphQL, and I haven't had a chance to look at it yet, so check it out as well. That's it. Great, a uh, ton of awesome resources there. Um, and I think, I don't know if you mentioned the actual name of that OCaml uh, interface, it's called Reason. So good luck Googling that. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I had a hard time finding that once. Um, okay, great, so for my tips, I'm actually gonna piggyback on uh, Dan's tip uh, about co-locating selectors. I, I, I'm gonna make it more broad as uh, co-locate AMAR, that's as much as reasonable. Um, so try to get like your your CSS and your GraphQL queries and your um, your HTML if you're doing if you're not doing React like put your HTML right there um, and like yeah just as much like your test files and every everything put it where it's being used and so like even if you have multiple components if it's only being used by one other component you just like extract it out put them where they're being used. Um, 
it just makes it a lot easier uh, to to think about this like structure of your application. Um, so yeah, co-locating is great. Um, and then I want to pick LGTM. Looks good to me. Uh, this is a, a service or like it's a, a GitHub status um, bot that will um, allow you to say um, like the like this pull request can't be merged until two maintainers say looks good to me or ship it or something. It's great. Um, it's enabling some really cool things uh, for um, open source projects on in the way of like automatic re releasing and doing all kinds of really cool things. So I like it. Code cartoons is really applicable for this episode, specifically the uh, a cartoon guide to Facebook's relay. Um, if you're interested in more of the inner workings, how everything works, uh, this is a fantastic blog post from uh, Lynn Clark, and so I recommend you check that out. Um, and then Aphrodite, this is CSS in JS done right. I totally love Aphrodite. It is amazing. Um, and so there are a lot of problems with doing inline styles and CSS and JS, um, but uh, Aphrodite gets around all of those by actually generating actual CSS styles and, and sticking those into the DOM. And so you can use media queries and, um, and pseudo elements and all kinds of that stuff without doing some magic uh, JavaScript stuff. Um, so yeah, it's fantastic. I recommend you check it out. Great. Uh, Lee, why don't we have you go next? Just got to unmute myself. Um, all right, so I have uh, one pick for the day, and it's a book. And it's a new book that isn't out yet, but you can pre-order it. And uh, I've had the, the ability to read some of it before it's come out, and it's super awesome. And so I like super can't wait for the whole thing to come out. It's called Suspension. You can find it at readsuspension.com to get a pre-order. Um, it's super cool. It's the sci-fi political thriller book um, that deals with zombies and... Uh, reality TV and the presidential race and it takes place in the United States in 2018. So it's like sci-fi but it's like sci-fi that happens very soon from now um, which is cool. Like I don't think we see that kind of writing that often. Um, so I'm super excited for that. Check that out. Cool. I'm looking forward to 2018. Uh, <laughs> um, cool. Steven. Yeah, I'm going to do my, my picks first. My first pick is uh, music. I want you all to take a look at the album Hope by the Strumbellas. This is an old friend of mine that I used to play in garages with back in Oshawa, Ontario. And now that band has gone to number one on the U.S. alternative charts for good reasons. So let's take a listen to, uh, to that. It's going to melt your face. Um, second thing is a book. It's called The Lost Chord by Conrad Amenta. This is an incredible science fiction book about a world in which algorithms have completely replaced performers in the musical, it, it, for music. Nobody produces music anymore, only algorithms produce music. And it's an absolute chilling view of the future, possibly the near future. And my tip is, uh, my tip is about resource contention, um, particularly about uh, America's highways and roadways. Uh, I bike to work every day. I live in Menlo Park right near Facebook's office. It takes me 16 minutes to bike to work each way. It's 100% flat because it's Silicon Valley. But there are a lot of four-way stops along the way, and uh, this message goes out to pretty much everybody, but like specifically Californians. And I want to give you a little tip for negotiating a four-way, three-way, or you know, an N-way stop. Here's the rule, basically. If you arrive at an N-way stop at the same time as one or more people, what do you do? Who goes first? Do you sort of like look at each other and you know do this and like, no you, no you, no you. Well, here's what the Highway Traffic Act has to say. And here's my, trip, my, my tip. If you arrive at an N-way stop at the same time as other people, take your right hand and point it out to the right of you. If you are pointing at nobody, it's your turn to go. That's the whole thing. You can think of it as right of way. If you are the rightmost vehicle, be that a car, a bus, or a truck, you've got the right of way. Go for it. If there's one thing that we don't need on American highways, it's diversity. We should all understand the rules and just, just run them on a daily basis. Love that tip. 
we, we need to get more of those kinds of tips. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, cool. Well, let's uh, let's wrap this up. Um, so I'd just like to give a quick shout out to our silver sponsor, Trading Technologies. They are hiring, and so check them out. Um, and then um, if you have suggestions for the show, we love getting uh, suggestions of guests or topics, so go to suggest.javascriptair.com. If you have feedback for this show or the show in general or a previous show, go to feedback.javascriptair.com and submit your feedback. Uh, and then we have a weekly newsletter that goes out about highlighting like highlights of the shows and, and with the show notes and everything. Uh, go to jsair.io slash email uh, to sign up for that and see previous ones. And then uh, remember, next week our show is Progressive Web Apps, and it's going to be the bomb. We're going to have a good time. And follow us on Twitter, Google+, and Facebook to keep up with the latest. And download the JS Air app on your iOS or Android phone. Um, and with that, I think uh, we can say goodbye. Thank you so, so much, uh, Lee and Steven. It has been a blast. Cool. Thanks for having us. We'll see you all next week. <laughs>